to invest in your people because they're the ones who are going to develop your product. People that are emotionally involved in your process and your product and uh, they feel a little bit of the ownership themselves. You're listening to Stories from the Top, an inside guide to better business development. We are here with Coach Dick Vermeil, the NFL Super Bowl champion and founder of Vermeil Wines. How do you like to describe your business and what's your role in the company? Well, I'm a 15% owner. I'm a, the originator of the company because it was my hobby. You know, I was born and raised in Calistoga, the north end of the Napa Valley. And I uh, grew up uh, drinking my grandfather Vermeil's homemade wine and grew up helping him make wine. And we were closely connected with the Freddie Annie Vineyard, which t- today is a 170-acre vineyard right there in Calistoga. My great-grandfather on the entire, Italian side of my family owned a portion of it a long time ago. We still pick that portion of the vineyard. Of course, it, they're newer vines. But uh, So I had the interest, and uh, I got going. I was making a little money, and I, I said, you know what? She said, I'd like to take the Vermeil name and put it on a wine bottle because uh, it was so important to my family, the wine and all that kind of stuff. And being close to the Freddie Annie Vidyard family, uh, a son-in-law had a, a little small winery on, on Spring Mountain in St. Lena, and he said he'd be glad to make the wine. And instead of putting his label on it, he would put Vermeil wine uh, Cabernet. Okay, so he started out as a hobby. He paid all the expenses. I paid nothing. And we made about 150, 200 cases. And that happened to be the first release was 1999, the year we won the Super Bowl. So it sold pretty well. And he said, well, let's keep doing it. And I said, great. And it was his business. And he's making his other wines, okay, on the Edge Winery. And, uh, it was, you know, he was selling it. And then pretty quick, some partners with some real money came in and said, Coach, let's uh, take your connections and turn it into a uh, business. So... Uh, as we moved on, we bought out the little winery and labeled it all for meal wines. And now all of a sudden we have 2,000 cases of wine, you know. In 2008, it became Vermeil wines completely because we are now making wines of our own that weren't already barreled uh, under on the edge label. And from 2008 on, we've been making anywhere from this last year 1,800 cases to as much as 26, 2,700 cases, depending on the crop. And we uh, did it that way, okay? We turned it into the business in 2008, and it's been a struggle. It took us 13 years to get where uh, it covers all the expenses and we have some money in the bank, which is a good feeling. No more capital calls and those kind of things. The club has grown to about 475 wine club members, 135 to 140 right here in Philadelphia. And we make very high-end, quality, expensive wine. Our winemaker uh, consultant is Thomas Brown, who is one of the leading uh, wine consultants and winemakers in the United States, and especially so in the Napa Valley, has produced many 100-rated wines himself, and he has his own label, Rivers Marie. The winemaker that works with him is uh, uh, Andy uh, Jones, and the, the wine is made at Meadowood Winery. Okay, we don't own our own winery. We don't own our own vineyards. So what we own is a label in the process and a tasting room on 1018 First Street in Napa, which there are some people from Philadelphia going in there today. Okay, people call me, so I set them up and send them in for a tasting. But it's been a long haul. It's been a long, slow, and people have told me in the past it takes 12 years to break even in the wine business. It took us 13. But we're not in it, you know, Making like the small amount of wine that we make in terms of number of cases, uh, it, it was never meant to be a big money deal, especially with me. It was a hobby, an interest, a, a passion, and something to keep me active after retiring from coaching. And we were doing a course with my last uh, few years uh, while well, I was in coaching, you know, at the Rams and the Chiefs after the Rams. So uh, overall now it's, it's, starting to, it's starting to go well, but it's never going to be a a thing you can base your estate on, believe me. But uh, we do make good wines, good grades. Our highest grade is 96. I think this year our cab's got, uh, with the 19, uh, 2019, it's got 94 grades, which is a nice grade for us. Yeah. Nice. Okay, good. Um, so, yeah, we kind of want to dig into a little bit of those steps you were taking as you were mm-hmm. growing the business. To, um, just to give some background, what kind of education did you have before, even before coaching? Did you go to school for anything? Or? No, I didn't. No, I was a physical education, health, 
physical education major, okay, because I wanted to be a coach and PE teacher and a health minor, uh, but uh, no education in wine or grapes or vineyards other than hands-on growing up around the Freddie Annie Vineyard and the Freddie, Freddie Annie Prune Orchards. And, you know, in Calistoga at that time, there were 1,800 people in town. And it was a cl- I had 29 kids in my graduating class, and half of them were involved in the wine world or prune world or walnut world. You know, mm-hmm. it was a farming culture and community. And my dad had an old garage, and uh, he worked on a lot of their cars. So I was always involved with people, and uh, especially Gene Frediani, the Frediani Vineyard. He was like a second dad. And you said your grandfather was in the wine business and also your great-grandfather, was that right? No, my grandfather wasn't in the wine business, Albert Vermeil. No, he just made it as a hobby. Oh, okay. And he had learned from Jean-Louis Vermeil, my great-grandfather, who came over from the south of France. He'd learned the process, and uh, he did it. I mean, well, I can remember getting in the big crusher and standing, and, you know, like they make jokes of with the juice coming up over your feet and everything yeah. else. But yeah, he would make, I would say he probably made uh, 25, 30 cases, maybe more. You know, I don't remember. Uh, I remember they looked like 50-gallon barrels, you know, and there's always a vintage here aging, a new one coming on, and, you know, that, that process for for the different things they do in making wine. My great-grandfather owned an 18-acre piece of vineyard and had the Calistoga Wine Merchant, I think it was called. It was only a hobby for him. Hmm. He was extremely successful in San Francisco after coming from Tuscany in Italy. And Napa Valley reminded him of Tuscany, so he started buying properties. At one time, he had over 20 properties up there, including the home that I was born and raised in. Uh, and, but that was, and he only lasted a while then, prohibition and, and all that kind of stuff, it, and depression, and he, he lost most of that. So. so this was really a family hobby that you were kind of born into family and exposed hobby, yeah. from the very beginning. Yeah. You know, as a kid, you're sitting there, and my dad would always pour me a glass of wine with half of it was water. And it was always a family conversation. What always uh, really stimulated me is to sit around the table on holidays and discuss the new vintage we're pouring and how my dad talked about it, how my grandfather talked about it, how friends around the table, they're, it's a wine world. And they talk about the different flavors. And I don't have that kind of palate. I know what I like, but I don't have the sophisticated sommelier type palate or training. But uh, that was always stimulating to me. And I thought, you know, and I grew up not looking at, at wine like I did a bot- can of beer. A can of beer is alcohol. I never thought of wine as being an alcohol, just a part of the family meal on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I still have that same thinking. But, uh, it, you know, it was deeply seated in, in great memories. So what was the catalyst, you'd say, that drove you in 1999 to say, Let, let's partner up and start doing this? Was there something that gave you the push to finally... Well, the catalyst was admiration from my dad, Jean-Louis Vermeil. I actually pronounced it Fetime. There's a picture right there on the wall of where they came from in the south of France. Next week, uh, next Wednesday, four of them from there show up here for five days. Okay, So uh, it was my uh, respect and admiration for my dad, and his grandfather's name was Jean-Louis Vermeil, so my great-grandfather. So I said, I'll just perpetuate the name. You know, I'm Richard Vermeil, not Jean-Louis. Uh, and uh, it was... So I had friends, you know, and I had the contacts and, and new people. And uh, Paul Smith was the winemaker and owner of On the Edge Winery, and he was a fine waker. He was with Mondavi's for 17 years, ran the Opus One program, not as a winemaker, as really the engineer that developed the whole thing and the communication between France and, and uh, you know, the, uh, Opus One. So, uh, you know, I had, I had all kinds of support. I really did. Yeah, so people were mostly supportive when you announced you were going to go into winemaking? Yeah, they were. Yeah, and, you know, and friends, you know, and they'd say, what are you going to do that for? I said, well, I, I, you know, I just, it's something I've started as a hobby. I enjoy it. I really enjoy giving bottles of wine to friends. You know, when, when I grew up, people walked in the house, they always walked in with a bottle of wine they made. You know, you, you exchange it within the community, and it just left a very positive, warm uh uh, memory and experience for me at that age, and and this way I could reinforce those thoughts. You know. So as you started partnering into the company and creating the business, did you bring any of your coaching experience into the business world, or what was? Well, you know, I, I I'm not a business guy. You know, and I have partners that have been extremely successful entrepreneurs that have made a lot of money, and I knew if we 
did go into it, they were not going to allow it to fail, and it was never going to be a deal. Well, we didn't make any much money this year. We're going to shut it down. They're going to keep it going, and that because of their persistence and their backing, and their home office is in Egg Harbor, New Jersey. And they have a super accountant, GM type guy there that really has taken over for me a wine from the business standpoint, from the do dollars and dimes and the organizations and the orders and all and the communication with our tasting room uh, and ma general manager, uh, Andrew Curry in Napa. And they're business guys. What I do is I sell the wine. I, I can go sell the wine. I can pour the wine in, in great places and uh, get great positive responses and even more so today than ever before because of Thomas Brown and, and Andy Jones commitment to it and people drink it they're surprised at the quality because they expect that's got a football coach's name on it which is just a hobby no it's excellent excellent wines so my, my question about that is um, I know you're passionate about wines you do the selling of wines as well um, but you mentioned these other people who uh, backed you up and didn't let that business fail so what were those different um, department heads that you really needed to succeed in this business? Well, first, you always need the people with money. You need the people that aren't going to panic when it isn't going well. You need people that have the ability, vision-wise, to see the potential of it. But see, I'm, I'm a, maybe presenting a little false image in that they, none of us went in it to make money. None of us wanted to lose money, but we wanted to make good wine, and if we broke even, that would be it. Okay. It's gone beyond that today, but that's the kind of support I had financially. And then they, their business expertise and people in their company, like Bill Kurtzis and Peter Michalaitis, who work daily on our business in communication with everything that goes on, the buying of barrels, the corks, the bottles, which have become a problem, uh, the bottling dates, all these, the marketing thing. And, and when we first came out, we sold wine wholesale to uh, different distributors, but to create cash flow. And we gradually, gradually, totally moved away from that because it, it just limited small amounts of wine. No volume is very, almost impossible. You're always going to lose money. And like plus, I was the guy on the road, you know, and I, I, you, you go into a restaurant and sell them six bottles of wine because they don't want to be a warehouse for your wines. They'll buy just what they can sell the next two weeks and ask, ask you to come back in two weeks. Well, I don't live in Kansas City. I don't live in St. Louis, you know. I don't live in Florida. You know, I, I live right here in Chester County. So we gradually got away from that. We did develop some good customers. Houston became a very good area for us. And in fact, there's a distributor there that still has uh, major steakhouses that pour our Blend 34 uh, as a glass of wine at the bar, and it's very popular there. But that's about the only place we really do it anymore. In fact, you don't even see it in the Pennsylvania State stores anymore. You just, you can't make it break even that way. And the way we're doing it now, with you're making limited amounts of wine, you have a wine club now of almost 475. By the end of the year, it'll be over 500 people. You have to have the wines. You know, we, we ship three times a year, a three bottle level, a six bottle level, a 12 bottle level, and a combination of, and uh, the all Cabernet level, which we, you know, uh, so we just don't have the wine to go out and sell it wholesale anymore. Were you guys doing private label originally, like letting other people brand the wine as their own? Or no, was no, it, always it, was, it was always ours. In fact, that picture was the original label. Yeah, that's a blown up snapshot. I'm mean, actually not a blown. That's a hand painted picture by a friend in St. Louis when I was coaching at the Rams. Yeah. Oh wow. I have. To, I'll show you later uh, the original bottle. But we've invested money in great getting uh, good wine uh, guidance. You know, it's so important to talk to people that know more about what you're doing than you do. You know, and now there's things that we know that they don't know because we are the owners and we're deeply emotionally involved. But when you come into a business that you've really never been in, you better uh, be humble enough to know what you don't know, then admit it, and then surround yourself with people that do know, and also make sure they do know what they say they know. And I've always been very lucky in surrounding myself with people that covered my holes within my own knowledge and talents. And uh, it, uh, that's the, I think that's the only way you can succeed. What's your process to finding those partners who you can not only trust, but know that they're going to? Number one, recommendations. I'm not a big interview guy, not even in the coaching world. You know, I, yeah, I'm not smart enough to sit with a guy for four hours and figure out he's an expert after four hours. 
But if I know somebody that's worked with somebody and he's worked for them five or six years and I trust that guy's opinion, he says, this guy is good. I listen to that. That's a short interview. I've brought guys in and hired them as football coaches and never interviewed them. The first time I met him was when I hired him because of the Bill Walsh said to hire him, because Rod Dauhauer said to hire him, because Andy Reid said to hire him, you know, because there's credibility. And uh, Paul Smith had a great reputation in the Napa Valley, and, uh, and he would ask questions too, but he, he, he was involved. He really, he was uh, like a straight-A student in both phases of wine culture and vineyards coming out of college in California. That was his education, and uh, we relied on him tremendously and uh, he, he eventually moved out of our business in big and uh, because his winery was in his home and that is sold and gone and uh, we custom crush now in like I said in mending wall winery in the Silverado Trail between Calistoga and St. Louis but the big thing is surround yourself with good people you know and my uh, fortunate uh, uh, talent has been I think uh, I would pick someone that I just had a great feel for as a, 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 say a, a guy that's got compassion combined with passion uh, that I, I feel good about. And then what his shortcomings are, we cover with somebody else or he develops them because he wants to work. You know, hard work's not a form of punishment, guys, you know. And uh, a lot of football players like that. A lot of people, do, especially the young kids today. Hmm. But uh, you, you, those kind of people... Uh, I don't care what kind of business you're in. If you don't have those kind of people, you're going to struggle. Good. So um, what was your guys' process when you had to come up? I guess there's a lot of regulations in the wine industry. Oh, yeah. How did you Ridiculous. guys navigate that when you got started? What was your process? to? Well, uh, Bill Curtis, our ex, he's actually like our chief operating officer out of Egg Harbor with her, uh, uh, John Scarpel and Michael Z's company. Uh, he'd call, communicate. You know, talk with people, talk with states. Every state has a different rule. Some of them are ridiculous. You know, state of Pennsylvania, it, it, they've eased the rules now. When we first were in business, we couldn't ship here. Now we ship direct to your home, and which is why we now have about 135 club members and some real solid Cabernet drinkers, you know. But uh, the regulations, of course, a company like I'm involved with, outside the wine world that's backing this, uh, they have lawyers and they have, they know who to go to and, and yeah, they're not maybe in the viticulture world, but they'll know who to talk to. And we learned eventually as we gain experience, you know, it's been 15 years now, it's in 2008, almost 15 years that we know who to talk to. We know who to call. I call Thomas Brown. I call Andy Jones. We call Mendingwell Winery. We call brokers. We call these different people and, and get answers. And, but now it's not a problem for us really that much anymore because, and like for example, I could sell a ton of wine in Delaware, but we're not licensed to go into Delaware. And so you don't bother. And uh, we, we don't need them. I'd like to have them because I have friends there. Uh, so, uh, you know, there, I, the, the state is so, the United States is so inconsistent with the liquor rules. For example, I'm going in the Hall of Fame in August. We're going to pour Vermeil wines at our party post uh, Enshrinement ceremony, okay? There's processes to go through to get it, make it legal, you know. Even these just guys, to do that. Yeah, just to do that. Wow. Yeah. So, how does the licensing work in each state? You have is that something you have to apply for, purchase? Yes. Or? Oh yeah, yeah. You you go through it. Uh, there's a legal process in every state, okay? California is easiest, okay? But they have they have their process, but it it's not restrictive. You know, uh, Pennsylvania's restricting. Though Pennsylvania's one of the largest buyers of wine in the United States. Hmm. You know, the life sell a lot of wine, but uh, it, it's different, you know, because this liquor control, state liquor control board, you, know, you sell a bottle of wine to, uh, as a wine company, it goes to the state store. I mean, the state comes in, brings it to the state, then it goes to the state store. So there's process of... Uh, the amount of costs keep going up every level and pretty quick you're asking too much for your wine it's it shouldn't be at that level you know mm -hmm. so there, there's process there are other states it's almost impossible and I, I don't i don't understand they're you know they're legalizing marijuana in different states and all. i want i don't understand it other than that you know the state makes a lot of money if they control it have you guys had a strategy of which states you want to go after for sales or? we initially did yes definitely yeah, you had to. 
based on their restrictions and their their legal process. Some states it's much easier than others, you know, and it was easier to get distributors because they know they're not uh, confined to uh, strict restrictions. And uh, so uh, we did that. Yeah, we were in and out of different states. And, you know, Total Wines, I think, has a little bit of our wine in most of their stores, maybe two cases. Mm -hmm. Don't sell a lot to them, but they like to carry it because people once in a while ask for it, you know. Which states are the most restrictive? I I, I would say uh, the Northeast up on top of the country up there is tough. Philadelphia is tough. Utah is tough. Uh, Delaware is stricter. You know, these kind of places, and I'm not really up to date on that. And I've sort of faded out of that business and moved more strictly to like I have three major engagements coming up this fall that I'll sell a ton of wine in major high-end country clubs. I'll go in and pour it with a couple of our employees will come in with us and we'll pour our wines and uh, they'll buy our wines. They will uh, join our wine club. And uh, we've had some very successful events. In the, we, we know where our market is. People that are used to buying quality wines and like to have some in their home and like to be in a club they get the shipment and like to order for gifts. Uh, PNC Bank right here has used us uh, to give Christmas presents, you know. The WIP has with uh, through uh, PNC, a, a big football event. They'll buy some wines and I'll sign the bottles and give them to them. Been very big advocates for us, so uh, we appreciate that. So for when you guys started out, did you guys have in mind the different types of wine you wanted to make? Yes. Or what was, how did you guys come up with that list? Well, I was Cabernet. I was hard-headed. I wanted 100% Cabernet. You know, some of the great, great, greatest French wines are not 100% Cabernet. We make three Cabernets now. Jean-Louis Vermeule Cabernet, which is our original basis of our business, uh, is 21% Cabernet Franc. It's a great glass of wine. The other two, Pickett Road and Rosedale Block, named after the roads that run in the Napa Valley, uh, are very high-end quality grapes. They're $150 a bottle, you know. Yeah, but we only make 125 cases or so. It's, see, we buy the grapes by the row. So one year, that those six rows produce more tonnage, so you make more wine. The next year, they don't. For example, our Sauvignon Blanc last year was off about 55%. We made 95 cases rather than 200. Hmm. See, so it, it, it varies from year to year. But, what, uh, what caused that? Why did it produce yeah, we, You less? know, when you ask any vineyard management guy what causes this to happen, they give you so many answers, you, lose the, you almost lose the question. There's no one single thing. Sometimes there is. Hey, we lost all our 2020 red grapes because of forest fire smoke, mm -hmm. not the flames. They didn't burn the vines. The smoke engulfed the berries at the bad, bad time when they're about to be picked in the fall. Ruined them. We have no 2020 red wine. So that flavor would get into the grapes oh, and yeah. just make it. And the problem with it, if, see, in our contracts, if we picked it, we paid for it. Hmm. Now, we picked the Zinfandel, and we, pate, we picked the, the Petit Syrah, thinking it was good. You know, as, and you don't find out it's tainted until you get, like, into the third stage of the process of making it. All of a sudden, it's no good, so you pour it out. $50,000 worth of grapes, out. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that's not a lot of fun. See, and we, up there, we've had forest fire problems twice. We've had earthquake, a major earthquake. We've had uh, flooding. <laughs> We've had high heat and drought. We've had every extreme that could cause us to fail. But due to the tenacity and the support of my partners, we kept it going in the tough times. Now the tasting room is doing well, uh, and the, the, the club is doing well, but we went through adversity. And if you don't handle adversity well, then don't get in the business world. <laughs> now, how do you hedge against those environmental well, you know, uh, we do as a company because of the str financial strength of my partners, not because of me. I'm a 15 percent owner. Okay, and uh, the farmer, for example, Freddie Annie Vineyard, is over 100 years old. Mrs. Freddie Annie was my babysitter, and I was born 85 years ago. I've been involved with that vineyard all my life. Okay, uh, they self-insured. What they do is every year part of their crop, the income from that crop, goes over here in storage. 
in the bank and sits there and do whatever they do with it, business standpoint. So if there is a bad year and they still have to do all these other things, they can cover it. There are people that pay forest fire insurance and all that kind of stuff. The mm-hmm. Freddie Annie's Vineyard was self-insured. And you guys aren't obligated to buy the grapes? No. If there's a weather If incident? we pick them, we own them. If we don't pick them, they own them. So is there like a down payment you put to hold the row? Because I guess you could buy all of them and then just... No, we're on an evergreen. It rotates every year. It's always like three years in front of us. And you have to give notification as to, you know, we plan to quit making petite syrah. Or, geez, you know, we're going to we're gonna not make Zimbadel. Let's just use it and say, yeah, you could, if you can sell that to someone else, we won't buy it. And if, because, you know, the four kids run it. One of them's going to be at my Hall of Fame induction, okay? So we have a relationship, which is so important in in the business world. Relationships, relationships. So you can get things done that aren't contrary to the philosophy of either side of the business, you know? So the vineyards are more of a partner than just a vendor. Oh, yeah. They're a family partner, really. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, good. So have you guys... How is your original of just making Cabernet? How, when did you guys decide to shift and expand the... Well, that's when the partners got in and, and bought him out because they, he had Zinfandel in the barrels, Cabernet Franc in the barrels and all that. And that was all going to become Vermeil wine products. So there they were. And we were able to sell them. The, the Zinfandel vineyards uh, was planted in 1908. Original vineyard. Still pick it. Now, it doesn't produce quite as much as it used to, but it still makes great Zimbadel. So you had these things, Petit Syrah, these kinds. There's no Merlot uh, that we would pick at that time. They didn't have Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, so Mrs. Fridiani uh, planted f- five acres of it for us, and we took part of it. And then in three or four years, we're, we're picking it, you know. And uh, our Chardonnay comes from uh, Dutton Ranch in Sonoma County, very, very high-end Chardonnay vineyard company over there. Uh, wonderful place and we make a couple hundred cases of chardonnay over there because people come in our tasting room and they'd like some chardonnay you, if if they, you don't have it then they don't come in and if they don't come in they don't try the other wines as well you know right. so, so your your expansion was kind of due to demand yeah people people ask, people ask for it and the access to the grapes right there in the fruity Annie vineyard yeah and does each wine come from a different variety of grape is that how oh that yeah works? oh yeah the, the blend, our 34, which is a blend, 34 Roman numeral for Super Bowl 34, uh, it is a Cabernet, Cabernet Franc, Petit Syrah. It used to have a little Zinfandel in it. And the percentage of each grape is varies from year to, varies from year, to year. So uh, you have to uh, trust your winemakers. It's a, very, it's a $56 bottle of wine. It's actually costing us more to make it than we should charge more for it because of the price of Cabernet Franc that goes in it now is the same price as Cabernet. So, you know, and that's, you know, $10,000 a ton. So, and more. So, uh, yeah. But anyway, uh, hmm. it, it all works together it, it, and it works a lot smoother once you get it running. <laughs> right. It's like you keep tuning up your engine, you know, you keep tuning up your engines, you keep Correct your mistakes. In, the, I, in coaching, I always told me and I told my coaching staff, yes, we're going to have another season next year. The number one person we have to improve is ourselves. Then we can improve our players. Then we can improve our product. Then we can improve our process. You know, And uh, winemaking at the high-end level is very, very sensitive. A grading, a, a, trying to achieve high 95 grades in that, uh, you can lose grading points in the transportation or the time it takes from when they're picked to when do they get to the crush, you know, and you know, sometimes two hours makes a difference. So you've, you've got to know what you're doing. I don't know what I'm doing. Football, I think I know what I'm doing. The wine world, I listen and learn, and I know a lot more now, but I still, and there are times I, I don't agree, but I, I, I never contradict those that do. So in that spirit of improvement, was there any specific area that you felt from the beginning that really needed to be improved, and then you've seen that improvement over time? Uh, you sp- spread the improvement philosophy into the mind of everybody that works for you. Hmm. You know, if you want to get better, yeah, yeah. You know, I was never the best, but I always tried to get better. 
And if you can implant that in the people you're working with, if they come to work and they're, they, they like where they're working, the atmosphere in the building is good, the relationships with each other are good, and, and they buy into, no matter how good we've been, we can get better if we do this a little better, or change this, or get some new equipment, or take a little different approach, or learn from the, the winery next door. You know, there's a lot of information shared in the Napa Valley when you're connected like we are with uh, Thomas Brown and Andy Jones. Yeah. That's that company culture idea. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, you know, you, when you go into a, and you can go into a store out here in our Chester County and walk in and you can, you can feel if the, the atmosphere is positive and you can feel if the atmosphere is negative. It doesn't take you long. It doesn't, you know, okay, I'm a so-called celebrity. When I go into a grocery store with Carol, Carol says, geez, you should come with me all the time. They treat me so much better <laughs> when you come with me. And I got, my thought is we treat everybody as if they're a so-called celebrity. Yeah. Mm. The dollar is the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. So um, what is your guys' process for quality control to make sure that you guys are putting out not just high-rated wine, but something that you're proud of? As yeah. Well, that's a good question. You, don't, you, you get in trouble chasing grades, okay? We don't chase grades. We appreciate them when we get good grades. But uh, our wine, you trust your winemaker and his palate. See, I have watched the blending of wines cover a table like we're sitting at with white sheet paper with test tube standards. And actually, they claim <laughs> in blending wines that they, by the percentage of blend in a test tube, can, they can transfer that same taste to a you know, 50 gallon barrel. You know, it's a little hard for me to believe sometimes, but they do it because these guys are chemists. The good winemakers are they're very intelligent people, and they're, they're chemists, and they know what they're doing, and you, you rely on those kind of people and, and their taste thoughts, their taste thoughts. But uh, like I said, I know what I like, and, uh, but I'm not a wine snob. I bought a $25 bottle of wine, thought it was excellent, and I bought a $150 bottle of wine, and they were very good. You know, if, if it tastes good to you, it's good wine. Uh, but we've gotten to a point now we can pour our wines to people that are sophisticated, that have a wine cellar full of high-end quality Napa Valley wines and really like our wines as well, which is, that sort of says we're there in the ballpark, you know. So when did you meet your winemakers? Well, Paul Smith I've known for, you know, because the original guy, the original partner with On the Edge Winery, he married into the Freddie Annie family. His ex-wife is coming to the Hall of Fame, Fred Mister Fred Annie. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, knew, I would, I would her babysitter. Okay, okay. So I've known her all my life. Her husband I met when after they got married, and then they were in their early twenties. So that's ever. But he's been out of our business now since, uh, oh, I'd say uh, 2014, somewhere out, and moved on. And, so uh, when you um, found his replacement, what was that process of finding someone? Well, I recruited him. You know, I, re I researched uh, who has the best re reputation. The, this one fellow lives in, uh, Thomas Brown lives in uh, Calistoga, my hometown. And he lived uh, just a few blocks from where our Calistoga tasting room was at that time. We no longer own it. We sold it. And uh, I recruited him as a cult consultant when Paul Smith was making our wine, and Paul was all for it too because he wanted to He wouldn't come. Then when Paul Smith left, uh, he came as our consultant and brought his winemaker that he works with a lot, Andy Jones, with us. And at that time, we were making it at Tampa Bay Winery. Originally, we were making it at the old Cuvasan Winery, so this is the third spot. But Thomas Brown owns a percentage of, of, of the Mendingwall Winery. His own label is... is <clears throat> Thomas Brown's own label is Rivers Marie, which is very hard to get. So was there a process of kind of teaching him what your guys' standards were, or is it just no? Handing he him taught us what his so, standards were. Yeah. 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 yeah, You know, there's a difference between delegation and designation. Okay, we designated him. Okay, so to recognize do this. his yeah. expertise. Yeah. And... yeah. Hmm. Sometimes a little knowledge is harmful. Oh, because you start trying to control things. Well, you that think you, you know maybe... more than you really do, and you don't. Right. Yeah. There's no substitute for wisdom. Hmm. You can hire it. It takes a long time for you to learn it. Yeah. Right. 
That's smart. Yeah, we've had a handful of interviews we've done recently, and that seems to be a common theme with successful people is that find experts to partner with and let them be the expert. Don't yeah. try to micromanage yeah. everyone's decision. And learn from them. And then, get, and then gain their respect so when you ask a question, they give you an answer that uh, satisfies you. And, and they aren't afraid to say, you know, you just can't do it that way, you know, either because you don't know enough about it. Yeah. So you said 2008 when you officially kind of like started running it like a business. Yeah. What did you guys change that took it from more of a hobby to actual business? What was My that? involvement in travel. I was on the road a lot, you know, two days, three, three days in Houston, two days in Kansas City, two days in St. Louis. I'd go to St. Louis and sell 50 cases. We had major brands, distributorship in St. Louis and Kansas City, and then later, at, and since then, Glaciers have bought them out. I think it was, that, if I remember right. But anyway, that's what we did, and made contact with uh, the Landry, uh, Landry uh, restaurant chain and these kind of things. Uh, but the, the restaurant business for little guys like us is really almost impossible, yeah. And what was your sales process when you're going on the road? Well, yeah, I would travel. I, we had a full-time employee that was doing it all the time when I would travel. He would set up the meetings and organizations, and I would fly in to meet him, either in Kansas City, St. Louis, Florida. I mean, we've been in different states. And uh, I'd meet with him. He'd have it all organized. He, Tom Ward was his name, and he, uh, he, we ended up giving him 1% of the business because he did a good job for us. And uh, just let him take me where I had to go. I, I didn't go in cold. I, I didn't have that kind of time. And who were you meeting with? What kind of uh, people? With distributors. We're pouring wine for distributors, and the distributor, I developed a great relationship. I keep going back to Houston from a friend at a speaking engagement. Okay. I was speaking in Puerto Rico or somewhere, and this guy was honored. Uh, Lincoln Financial Salesman of the Year had been that many times, many times in Houston. So uh, I met him at this speaking engagement. I forget where we were, some mm -hmm. island. And uh, he said, I understand you're in wines. I said, yeah, it's a hobby. I'm not like a lot. He said, well, I, I might have the largest French collection of wine in the United States. I got about 15,000 bottles. Wow. He says, in fact, I travel with my own wine. Would you like to taste some? I said, oh, tell me, give me your room number. <laughs> <laughs> so we developed a, ration, a relationship in three days at this convention. And he says, you know, you ought to come to Houston. My number one client is, is Specs in Houston, and the, the owner of that company, the daughter and the owner of that company, uh, are personal friends. I, I manage your estate planning and all that. He said, I'll introduce you. Well, a week later, I'm there. So I get involved with Specs, and they assign me uh, a salesman to work with, uh, Rodney Jones, uh, Rodney Brown, rather. Yeah, and I, we developed a relationship for six, seven years. I went in there four or five times a, a, a year in the off seasons, and and sell wines, and he'd have it all organized. And we we were in a lot of major, you know, president, uh, uh, presidents, country clubs, and all these kind of different things. Which it, wine is it? Is uh, loves Houston. Okay, Houston's a good wine city. A lot of steakhouses. A lot of people drink wine there. And there's little specs happen to be at when I got involved with them. They had about 90 stores, and all of a sudden they're at like 190 today, around the state. And, but again, we have moved away from that business because we just don't make enough wine to sell at wholesale. They're not have enough to sell retail. You know, you just can't meet expenses. So, so now you're kind of more going for the yearly subscription type, almost right? yearly subscription and hands-on direct sales, personal. Some online people, I'll do a speaking engagement and say, "Geez, you know, if you like Vermeil wine, just Google Vermeil wines. We'll get some responses." And uh, I'll set up wine tasting events for, like I said, there's a pr couple coming into tasting room in Napa today. Uh, there's another one coming in from this area. Whenever I do anything public, I always say, Gee, if you'd like to visit my tasting room, call me. I give them my cell phone number. They call me, hey, coach, we're going to the Napa Valley. I'll set up a tasting for them on me. And uh, invariably, we'll end up with wine club members. Yeah. You and, know, um, when, when people get in the wine world, they like wine more than they do when they're home drinking it. The whole atmosphere turns them on, you know, and they've already had three stops. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So have you, with other winemakers out there, like how have you guys, I don't, I don't want to call them competition. How do you guys oh, view your other, other winemakers out there? With great respect. With the Freddie Annie Vineyard, I'm out there for almost a month in the fall. I, what I do is drive tractor. Then I go with the grandson who delivers wines to the great wineries. 
delivers grapes, rather, because 170 acres, yeah, they're producing over 300 tons of grapes. Well, we maybe get 30 tons. You know, so we're, I go with them. I, I meet people from Camus to, to Stag's Leap to, to all these different wineries, you know, and uh, I, I meet people. And because I have a Vermeil name that's born and raised in that valley, it's a football name, and many of them want to talk football. You know, so you develop a little relationship with people in that way. But really, uh, Wine Spectator, yeah, uh, and I spend like three to four days a year just in wine meetings out there discuss what other people are doing and what we can do better and we we always listen to the thomas brown and the andy jones you know and we before we do anything it, it goes across the, their process evaluation process it's in front of them and we, we get the opinion and uh, we don't need a lecture all we need is some advice you know and what do you think and they'll tell us but uh and it sounds making, like, uh, in hearing you talk, it sounds like whenever there's an opportunity, you really kind of seize on it, jump on it. Well, um, do you have any, like, how do you evaluate what opportunities that you should jump on and which ones you should let go? Well, for example, I got three coming up in New York. We did one at uh, New Rochelle last year. Home run. Home run. People love the wine. The country club, Robert Casera is the general manager, and he's, he's sort of the president of the general manager's club. And he said, my God, the people love the wines. And we'd signed 12 club members and sold $58,000 worth of wine. Uh, they liked the wine. And I'm sure, we'll go back there. But he sets us up other places in. The recommendation is good. Uh, but these people are used to drinking good wine. So, uh, and I, I, I don't think we'll ever get to the point where a person who is a sophisticated wine drinker can't afford it. We're, we're not in the Harlan or the uh, Bryant family or the Colgen and those high, 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 high end, you know, screaming eagle and crying. they're way up there. But uh, we can compete quality wise. And now the, the good thing for us, people know it. We have winemakers that stop in our tasting room. I've been there when they did it mm -hmm. and they have gone up 15 different tasting rooms said, coach, this is the best wine on the block. And they're making wine, too. So I, I know we're doing it right. What was your guys' process to break into that circle of fine wine versus just another wine? Well, it's 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 a pride thing. I, I my you know I had no rules when I grew up in Calistoga. My only rule is never embarrass your Vermeil family name. So anything I ever tried to put my name on, I wanted it done right. Because I'm going to take, if I can't take pride in it, I'm not going to do it. And yes, I could drink cheap wine and now that, and I'm not a snob or anything like that. But if I was going to put the Vermeil name on a wine label, I wanted to, to represent integrity, quality, you know, uh, a, a passion for the business and a compassion for the people that drink it. You know, I've had, I've met so many wonderful people because I like wine. It's amazing. I mean, it's, it's just been I mean, you know, when I go to St. Louis, I'm at, you know, within there a few days, and all of a sudden I got cases of wine delivered to the office. Same thing, Kansas City. They know I'm a wine guy, and all of a sudden, someone who's big in wine, I met Don Bryant, Bryant Family Winyards. $500 a bottle of stuff is today, okay? Mm. <laughs> one the, they're really the father of the 100-point the Cabernets in the Napa Valley. He lived in St. Louis, football fan. All of a sudden, I'm dr drinking bottles of wine with him, you know? So you... You know, you, you grew it that way, and uh, but I, I think, uh, for example, we're going to make a two hundred fifty dollar bottle of wine celebrating this Hall of Fame event coming up. It uh, and it's going to cost us a fortune to do it because we're getting the grapes from Bextoffer Vineyard. We we can't get any more uh, grapes from Freddie Annie. This is coming from Bextoffer, which their overall vineyard complex in Napa Valley is probably number one vineyard in the Napa Valley and they they make wines for people or and sell grapes to people that are making very very expensive wines and but it's very expensive to get the grapes so we're going to make a couple hundred cases and and try it uh and sell it as a as a memento of the hall of fame and as a, a memorabilia of peace and then if it if it's successful then we'll continue to make it probably long probably under a label that we used a while back called Integrity, which will, uh, we, we had a blend called Integrity. We, we quit making it, because it was a high-end blend, and we, we were just, we were making too much. 
and we, so we were falling back in the sales. And uh, we could do it today because now we need it. But at that time, we were making too much wine with that mm-hmm. included. And so it's we've got too much on the shelves, and we're making another vintage, you know. So the expenses started catching up with us. So we backed it off. But we, we can now, with the volume of wine we're selling, uh, we could we could name a very expensive bottle of wine and use that integrity label, which we already own. See. So what is it that drives up the price of those high cost wines? Number one, the grapes. That's number one. Let's say you, if you if you pay ten thousand dollars a ton for the grape, the the starting price for that bottle of wine is a hundred dollars a bottle. That's just the starting price. Now for people like us that don't own the vineyard and don't own the winery, and you're not the winemaker, so it it adds on to it. Uh, you can spend it up to thirty-five to forty thousand dollars a ton. It's automatically uh, you can, but there's not a lot of it. But if you want it, you can get it. And but most of that uh, is all spoken for now with the high-end label, the very very high-end. And why are some grapes so much more expensive than others? Soil, yeah. For example. I talked about Pickett Road Cabernet. It's a 94 grade this year, as is Rosedale. Two football part. I, I use a football cliche. <laughs> Two football fields apart, but the soil's different. In France, you, they go from row to row, you know. But the soil structure with the terroir, the rock structure, the the different minerals within that area, yeah, yeah the, the access to a little bit more water, you know, deep down in with the roots get. Uh, make a difference make a difference the other thing is the handling uh, the vinter the guy that handles the grapes vines on a daily basis uh, it, well, i treat they treat those things like they're rolex watches <laughs> the guys that really are making the wine i mean it's amazing it's so much more sophisticated than the day i was working in the vineyards and picking grapes as a kid the only vineyard left at that is this vendel vineyard where it's not up on stakes, on uh, tea vines, and this kind of stuff. And uh, you, you have to crawl underneath the big vines to pick the grapes. You can't drive the tractor down because the vines overlap. So you got to pick them, put them on your head, 45 pound box of grapes, and run and dump them into the bin pulled by the tractor. In, in the modern vineyards, you drive right down in between them. You know, pickers are right beside you and pick, drop them in. And you know, you'll pick. They'll pick two tons of grape in 25 minutes by hand. Mm. Uh, but uh, the old one, you don't. The advantage of that, we know what the advantage is of that, the old days, heat. Napa Valley gets very hot, doesn't hurt those grapes because they have their own umbrella. Oh, okay. <laughs> they have their own shade provided shade, for them. Yeah. But when you you put them out on tea vines and the stakes and that kind of stuff, then you have, you have heat problems. It can be 105, 106. It's all right if it's a day, but if it's eight days in a row, you're in trouble. They'll they'll burn just like raisins. Hmm. Yeah. So when you say you're talking about something like the Hall of Fame, it's obviously not just a new label. It's actually really high quality grapes that oh, are yeah. going into it to oh, buy yeah. that it's price tag. Costing a fortune. But see, right now we can afford to take that kind of hit because we have money in the bank. You know, four years ago we couldn't do that. You 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 unless our partners could do it, just take it out of their pocket and do it. You know. But we really didn't approach it, the business that way that much. And, uh, but now we can afford to go ahead and experiment with a higher bottle because of the, the prestige of the Hall of Fame. Uh, and we're and in the process, I should hear today with all right to use the uh, uh, Hall of Fame logo just as a little part of the label. Yeah, that would be really cool. So is there like an industry standard profit margin you mark up like your costs to get to that? Or how do you guys do pricing you know it, again it starts it starts with the price of the grape as i've already said and then it goes from there your expenses and everything else and you know one of the things that's happened in the napa valley there are people and it's not a negative because it enhances the valley and the quality is for example i have a very very good friend that lives right around the corner he owned an unbelievable winery and home and vineyard he built himself in napa valley he sold it. You know who bought it? Two executives from Apple. These people with a lot of money come in and buy it. This is what how they want to retire, and they're not as cons- yes, they don't want to lose money, but their life doesn't uh, revolve around the income of that business. Mm-hmm. So that you know what happens too. It also happens is all of a sudden they start 
they need employees. Employees are getting tough, you know. Grandfathers, I have grandfa grandfathers that ride on my tractor, uh, the bins I'm pulling to sort the leaves, and their sons dump the, pick the grapes and pour them in there, but the grandsons aren't doing it. Hmm. They don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> they graduated from Cal Cal High School, and they're maybe going on to college. They're doing, but they, so uh, uh, it's things like that are starting to appear. I think all over the country, not just in the wine industry. Why do you think that is? Well, you know, kids don't want to work like they used to work. <laughs> just drive around here and see the number of signs in the window looking for help mm -hmm. for for the you know the, the everyday hard work and and it's getting uh, harder for uh, the Mexican. The Hispanic to get into the valley, and uh, the Freddie Annie Vineyard, for example, has three families that've been with them like 35, 40 years. They provide them housing and everything, and the kids grow up in there. But they're the young kids aren't too excited about doing that. If you have four kids, maybe only one of them really wants to do that. Yeah, and there are families that started like that that I went to high school with. Okay, graduating in 1954, that they came to the valley as migrant workers. They own their own winery. They own their own winery and vineyards today. You know, so it, there's possibilities there, but you got to work. Hmm. So what was your guys' process to get into that high-end clientele base to sell the more expensive wine? The process is, is, is simple. It, it all depends on the grape you pick, number one, and the guy who the guy who manages that vineyard, and then the winemaker and his process. If you don't have the right team, I don't care what business you're in, especially in the high-end quality wine. You can't charge somebody $200 a bottle of wine. It tastes like a $50 bottle of wine. To the expert, most people can't differentiate. I've, I've poured $700 bottle of wine that was given to me and tasted against our wine, and I don't have the palate to distinguish. I know it's excellent. And I can't tell you it isn't slightly better than ours, but I don't have that distinguishing. Not many people do. There aren't many sommeliers that can, really. But, uh, it's uh, you know, it's the process of of skilled uh, people that take pride in what they're doing, uh, like to be on a winning team. Uh, they like to share the uh, positive experiences, and they do a great job of handling the negative experiences because you're going to have them. So someone who's buying a couple hundred dollar bottle of wine, they probably understand what's inside of it. And oh, yeah. Why Some people do. Some people buy it because it, it, it enhances their own ego. Or image, or they're trying to impress somebody, and they can afford it. You know, two hundred dollars isn't a lot of money to some people. You know, they aren't working by the hour. You know, mm -hmm. but uh, you go to a restaurant now. It's I tried to go to bring your own wine restaurants, or bring and pay a corkage because I have so much wine stored over the years. And before I really got deep into the business, I, I was collecting wines, so I had too much wine, and uh, so I drink more of somebody else's wine than I do my own. And a high percentage of wine I ever get in this house goes out to charities. They eat you alive. They just everybody wants to give wine away as a charity thing. Mm -hmm. you know? As like a fundraiser. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you we, do a lot of fundraising, speaking events? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Quite bad. I've narrowed it down. I had the Vermeil Charity uh, Boy Scout term at Chester County for 27 years. We made a lot of money over the years, and uh, I have the COVID hit going on 28. We had it all organized to go, so we had to cancel it. And then during that cancellation period, I started hearing from all the guys that support, the, you know, the celebrities. They're glad it's over because, you know, some of them can't. They're my age and players in the Philadelphia area. They're in their, today, they're in their early 70s, late 60s, you know, and they, got, they don't play golf anymore because their bodies hurt. <laughs> so they were almost relieved they didn't feel the obligation to support me. And, you know, I, I sort of get tired of asking people for money. <laughs> My name has been involved with so many things. And I believe now I'm more into helping, uh, uh, for example, we have a special needs granddaughter. Help with a CHOP, help in a Cool Cars for Kids event, uh, Born Leaf a summer camp for special needs kids and these kind of things, and direct what I give and direct what I help raise in that effort. But otherwise... There is no such thing as a bad charity. It's just, it's just one after another. And I, you know, I'm not negative about them. I just can't service them all. Right. So you mentioned uh, the pandemic. I know right now there's a lot of supply chain stuff. You mentioned that too. Yeah, problem. What's, what's going on in the business with supply chain and how are you guys Bottles? dealing with it? 
Well, last year we bottled our uh, Sauvignon Blanc in, in heavy Cabernet bottles. Couldn't get the lightweight ones. You know, Sauvignon Blanc was ready to go in a year, you know, but we couldn't get them. So all of a sudden you pick up a bottle of Sauvignon Blanc, and holy mackerel, what's in there? You know, but we couldn't get them. And, and the prices keep going up, you know, with these kinds of things on everything. That the extra shipping, week, yeah, probably the shipping. The shipping oh, costs. yeah. And, you know, with, now we're shipping to, to uh, you know, 475 different addresses. Uh, expenses go up. And I understand that. You know, that's, everybody is feeling that today. Yeah. It makes it, it makes it difficult to hold your price. I am probably the most negative guy within our business in regard to raising prices. Because, see, I never went in to make money. And uh, I, I want people that really enjoy wine to still be able to buy it. I don't want to price it out of, of their level because they, they are the reason we're successful today. I don't want to keep price, pricing it above where they can't buy it anymore. Mm -hmm. But the expenses, fortunately for my guys, I've said this a few times, fortunately for me, uh, my guys are very successful in other business worlds, certainly, and, uh, and they carried the load when we weren't breaking even for a long time. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, do you guys have any long-term goals looking into the future for Vermont yeah, wine? What I do. I'm 85 years old, and uh, the only thing we really, really own is the label, Vermeil label. We own that. We don't own the tasting room. We lease it. We the room we owned in Calistoga, we sold. So, uh, I would like to uh, make sure that at least my percentage gets in the hands of someone that respects what we have done and will continue to grow the quality of the wine, maybe not make any more. You know, about 80% of the wineries in Napa Valley are 10,000 cases or less, you know, and, and family owned, family owned. It's the big one. But uh, to try to keep it, uh, to, so it, what's the term, perpetuates itself. And you need the right people to do that because my partners, he just celebrated his 80th birthday. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I, I like to have that. I've talked to uh, some specific people about it. My kids aren't interested. Yeah. We, we could sell our, if I lived out there, we would have to find a way to double what we make in a year. Because when I'm there, I can sell wine. And uh, it's, because you're hands-on, you're face-to-face -face with people, you're pouring it for them, you know, and you're visiting them, and you're at that event. But uh, when you're this far away, it's more difficult. That's why I, I have a little Zoom. I have three Zoom things set up coming up here uh, in August for Rico Corporation, okay? And uh, I pour the wine taste and invariably we'll end up some wine club members. They buy the wine we're drinking, they're drinking, and I'm opening mine downstairs and we do a zoom it's been very successful for us and uh, yeah it touches a lot of people i've done it for pnc bank for loads of people yeah yeah so no in the family succession plans for the business i don't see it you know if uh, if i had died if i died tomorrow the kids would own the 15 percent but i i've talked to b both of them about wanting to move out there and really get deeply involved and the, you know they have their own lives yeah it'd be nice but uh, i've ha i've had a plan uh, and I have a person picked out, and uh, I haven't convinced him to do it yet. <laughs> but, but anyway, we'll see. Good. Um, well, to close, I just wanted to ask if you had advice you wanted to share with entrepreneurs or people who are thinking of starting a business. What, what would be your advice to someone who's looking to start in the business world, in wine or anything, really? Well, I, I think, first off, what you have to do is invest in your people. And because they're the ones that are going to develop your product. There's so many people in the business world that are so worried about their product that pretty quick they can't maintain the level that they had it once achieved because the people grind down. And uh, I just think you've got to ha have people that are emotionally involved in your process and your product and uh, that they, f they feel a little bit of the ownership themselves. And, and that you treat them, you know, like the old expression, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. But uh, people have an unbelievable tolerance for appreciation, you know, and uh, you've got to uh, uh, 
make sure, you, yes, your product, they're all doing it, but it's people for the most part. Now, technology's entered, but someone still runs the technology. Someone still thinks ahead of that. Someone interprets things and someone, but you know, some people just have a great feel for things too. You know, just like quarterbacks, they can all they can all look like they can throw the ball 75 yards downfield, but they all can to play ball Sunday. You know, same thing when you're putting a team together in a, any kind of business. Yeah. You know? Okay. Makes sense. Um, so, how can people learn more about Vermeil Wines? And you guys have anything going on this year you want to talk? Just about? Just Google Vermeil Wines. Just Google Vermeil Wines. You know, and it's it's simple. You can go on there. They got a bunch of stuff on there. You can see what we sell and what's going on and. Uh, uh, it's uh, the tasting room is very nice. We get a lot of compliments in our tasting room, and we get a lot of Pennsylvania people that go in there. And uh, it, that when we started the, on 1018 First Street in Napa, there were only a few tasting rooms. Now there's I don't know, maybe over a dozen of them right there in the area. And so yeah, and, and we send people to their tasting rooms, and they send them to our tasting rooms. But uh, we have you know met, you mentioned competition. Uh, we have no problem pouring our wines against anybody else's wines, and I don't tell them it's better. That's for them to determine if they like it better. Yeah. First off, if I'm sitting there and I'm pouring the wine, even if they don't like it, they'll tell you they like it. Okay. <laughs> they, they don't want to embarrass you or hurt your feelings or anything. But what I like is when I get a note from somebody, I, geez, I stopped in that potato room. Gosh, your, your wines are really good and good, coach. Keep it going. And I love it. I get those emails and notes and that kind of thing. And uh, that's what I love that, that it's not influenced by, uh, not, it's not influenced by relationship, it's influenced by uh, their taste buds and, and their, their, uh, their appreciation for quality. Nice. Okay, well, Coach, thank you so much for your time and allowing us to come into your house and All right. speak with you today. Yeah, Love talking you. about wine business. Okay. <laughs> okay. Take All care. Right, take care. Stories from the Top is your guide to successful business development. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or find Edge of Cinema on YouTube. Stories from the Top is an Edge of Cinema production hosted by Matthew Skura and Jeremy Schmidt. To learn more or get in touch, visit edgeofcinema.com slash podcast.